Good morning, everyone. My name is Gloria Ye, and I'm delighted to welcome everyone to the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine, a monthly Grand Round series. And today, our Grand Rounds is jointly sponsored by the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center Division of Gerontology and the Brigham and Women's Hospital Division of Aging. So we're very excited for today's speaker. Uh, for, for those of you who are uh, new to our, um, our series and just joining us today, uh, if you want to request CME credit, you can email hmsoshercenter at partners.org. Uh, and uh, you can uh, pose questions to our speaker at any time during uh, today's talk through the Q&A function in Zoom. And our moderator will uh, uh, be able to pose those to our speaker um, during our Q&A session. Okay. So uh, before we get started introducing today's speaker, I actually have two announcements from the Osher Center I'd like to give. Uh, the first is that the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine at uh, Harvard Medical School is seeking a new program coordinator. So either part-time or full-time. Uh, so anyone who might be interested in being an integral part of our Osher team here in Boston uh, with experience in marketing and administration, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so you can please go to the careers page on our website, oshercenter.org, for more information. Uh, the second announcement is that the Osher Center is hosting the uh, inaugural Science of Tai Chi as Whole Person Health Conference, which will be held here in Boston in September, September 18th and 19th. Uh, and we hope and anticipate that this will really be a landmark event uh, that's going to be grounded in the concept of uh, mind-body movement within the framework of whole person health and cross-systems thinking. And we're uh, going to have sessions that address very timely issues such as implementation and dissemination. So the call for scientific abstracts, uh, as well as the call for symposia proposals are due April 21st. So we're interested in your research on mindful movement practices, Tai Chi, yoga, uh, other mindfulness-based interventions. So that website is Osher Center. I'm sorry, that website is oshersciencetcq.com for more information. Okay, so now I'd like to hand it over to my OSHA colleague, Julia Lowenthal, who will introduce today's speaker. Uh, Dr. Lowenthal is a geriatrician at Brigham and Women's Hospital who sees patients for healthy aging consults at the OSHA Clinical Center. She's also the author of a very recent paper in the Annals of Internal Medicine on yoga and frailty in older adults. Julia? Hi, thank you, Gloria. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Louise Aronson and thank her for joining at 5 a.m. her time. Um, Dr. Aronson is a leading geriatrician, writer, educator, and professor of medicine at UCSF. She's the author of the New York Times bestseller and Pulitzer Prize finalist, Elderhood, Redefining Aging, Transforming Medicine, and Reimagining Life. Dr. Aronson leads the integrative aging practice at the UCSF Osher Center for Integrative Health, the Age Self-Care Program, and serves as an advisor to the state of California on COVID-19 and elders. Her writing and media credits are numerous and include the New York Times, New England Journal of Medicine, CBS, and many others. As a geriatric medicine fellow, I read Dr. Aronson's book and I had the good fortune of meeting her as part of the American Geriatric Society Healthy Aging Special Interest Group. We were fortunate to be awarded a travel grant from the Osher Collaborative Exchange Program to share ideas in this emerging geriatric integrative health space and expand her novel clinical program, Age Self-Care. Dr. Aronson, I'll turn it over to you. Terrific, thank you, Julia. Um, and I just wanna uh, thank you also for arranging all of this and making it possible and, and doing most of the work that got us the grants that, um, that got me here. Um, so this has been a good challenge because uh, what sounded like a great idea at first, okay, we're going to mix aging with integrative medicine, became a sort of technical challenge because you don't want to tell people things they already know. So I'm trying to, to make this accessible to all um, in various ways. Um, there are also certain things that are not in this talk. Um, uh, mostly because you all have tremendous expertise in it, such as Tai Chi, which has been mentioned, and Julia's paper, which was also mentioned. 
Um, so I am going to start sharing my slides and get this rolling. Um, so I've, I've titled it Integrative Aging, Better Health Across the Stages of Old Age, because I, I think one of our challenges in healthcare is sort of thinking of old age as a singular thing. Um, you know, all our personal experience um, and experience of others notwithstanding. Uh, when I'm talking about uh, healthy aging, people often think, oh, I'm trying to make everybody look like these two people who clearly um, have been superior in how they look throughout their lives. Um, not necessarily. Uh, probably uh, some of that is genetics and some of it is things that go backward in time that we can't control. So what am I really trying to do today? Uh, help define what Julia just mentioned as this emerging field of integrative aging. Um, and then sort of a back and forth. You know, what are some things from geriatrics that might help integrative care and vice versa? Um, and I'm going to go through a few cases um, to, to show just a tiny fraction of the ways one might apply this in clinical practice. Uh, but it seems worth starting with the question, like, what the heck is integrative aging? Um, and, and I suppose if we're completely honest, um, we could say it, it's not uh, necessarily officially defined yet. Um, I came to it this way. Uh, the American Geriatric Society, of which I have been a member my, my whole career, um, talks about our mission being to improve the health, independence, and quality of life of all older people. And at some point, it occurred to me that I knew a lot about disease, but less about health. Um, and I knew a lot about really old people or very frail people or homebound people, but I didn't really know about all older people. Um, so that got me thinking. Uh, there is this constant refrain in aging about there aren't enough geriatricians and there never will be. Uh, and, and at some point when your career has spanned 30 years, as mine now has, you think like, are we going to keep walking into the same wall year after year, decade after decade? If something isn't working, change it up. And this is one of the ways I think we can and should change up elder care um, in the United States. Uh, I love the World Health Organization definition of health as a state of complete physical mental and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. This is inclusive of people of all ages, young and old, and people of all abilities, because of course you could have an infirmity, you could have a disability, you could have a disease um, from the moment you're born, if not sooner. Um, so this is lovely and inclusive, and, and some people think healthy aging is an oxymoron, not with this definition of health. Um, which has admittedly some overlap with well-being and yet is distinct. Um, I thought since this was Harvard, I would also um, feature a couple of uh, Harvard uh, docs or associated ones. Um, this is a tool Gawande um, writing in the New Yorker, oh, I think it was circa 07 or 08, um, uh, the pre being mortal. Most doctors treat disease and figure that the rest will take care of itself. And if it doesn't, if a patient is becoming infirm and heading towards a nursing home, well, that isn't really a medical problem, is it? To a geriatrician, though, it is a medical problem. And here is where I really see a beautiful overlap between integrative health um, and geriatric medicine. It's thinking bigger. It's thinking beyond the disease, the organ, even the whole person, to the, not the context, but the contexts that determine the health and well-being of that unique individual. Um, it turns out that healthy aging um, has been around longer than I've been a geriatrician, actually. So in 1987, one of the founders of American Geriatric Medicine, Jack Rowe, um, along with um, Bob Kahn, talked about how, you know, aging was so focused on losses and neglected the heterogene heterogeneity. Now, I think some people in the healthy aging sector go too much to like, it's all happy, you know, eat your blueberries and kale and you won't grow old and you won't die, which clearly isn't true. Um, so, and then they talk about how the modifying effects of diet, exercise, personal habits, which at this point, uh, and, and uh, was not acknowledged like the many layers of history and sociocultural context, which form our personal habits and our personal opportunities, um, but really just talking about the other factors that determine whether we age well, so to speak, or have a long, um, longer uh, life or a longer health span. Um, 
there is a 30 year gap in this country between um, longevity, depending on where you live, um, the color of your skin, uh, how much money you have in the bank, how much education you have. Um, but geriatrics kind of ignored this until 2015 when Susan Friedman and colleagues um, at Rochester started to focus on healthy aging. Um, this really rekindled the conversation and led to the group that, that um, was part of the group that Julia and I um, met in. But I think it's still a little narrow, and this is where integrative aging comes in. Healthy aging is just lifestyle, and I think integrative is something bigger. Uh, so another Harvard doc here, um, Andy Weil, or Harvard uh, formerly affiliated, you may or may not want to claim him, um, what he talks about, and this has been my experience as a primary care clinician throughout my career, is that we do not have a health system. We have a disease management system, one that depends on ruinously expensive drugs and surgeries that treat health conditions after they manifest um, and at high cost. And if you take care of older people um, at high personal cost, um, often uh, doing harm and then blaming old age for the harm done by the system, um, and then echoing row and con, you know, ignoring the diet and lifestyle tools that might be of use. So again, this this is sort of saying to me, hey, we we have some systems that we could pull together to do better by our patients. Um, when I when I looked at geriatric medicine versus integrative medicine, I could see a lot of things uh, that were similar, some differences. You know, in geriatric medicine, we're focusing on old people, and you can define that a number of ways. Um, some people start at 40, uh, you know, age discrimination. Some people start at 50, AARP, et cetera. Um, some people start at 65. Uh, some people never start. Um, the healing focus of integrative medicine, which I think is, is part of that health and healing is what's missing from geriatrics. Um, but in integrative medicine, similarly, a, a whole a, a view of the entire lifespan of how what we can do in integrative health needs to be modified um, over the decades and stages of um, older life, um, thinking about physical function, thinking about geriatric syndromes. So there's opportunity uh, for overlap and to pull from both camps quite nicely. Uh, so my integrative aging approach um, is, is very much goals tailored to the particular person. So that comes from both. Health and wellness prioritized comes from integrative medicine, um, including attention to self-care agency purpose and internalized ageism um, comes from both. It's basically taking literature from geriatrics, but applying an integrative health lens to that, to pull those things into a clinical scenario. Um, the clinician as a therapeutic tool drawing from many disciplines and integrative approach, and then explicit avoidance of age-based over and under treatment coming from geriatrics. So why do this? Um, and I'm gonna try and be quick about this and get to the how do we do this um, and the cases. Uh, you know, people are already using this in huge numbers, older people in particular, which means there are unmet needs. Um, you know, an NCCIH study, uh, which admittedly is 10 years old, but they haven't redone it, um, shows natural products, deep breathing, um, yoga and Tai Chi as the leads. A more recent Michigan poll on healthy aging study shows chiropractic care, massage, meditation, yoga. Um, I think it depends on who you ask and maybe how you ask. Um, and I will note the age bias of the Michigan poll because it um, only surveys adults age 50 to 80. Um, which seems interesting, um, as if, you know, aging stops or, or your ability to change and learn and receive good care stops. Um, it might also be that it's just harder to reach people. Um, but few people talk to their doctors about it. And I wonder if we asked about some of these techniques, might we elicit unmet needs? Um, might we partner more effectively with patients um, in taking care of them? Uh, there's a societal imperative. These are some absolutely offensive images um, about aging and the silver tsunami. Um, there is no upside to a tsunami. So we live in a country where on the one hand, we do all kinds of things uh, to not die, um, but then we blame people for being older. There are market forces that are astronomical. Um, so uh, elder care tends to be underfinanced, geriatrics in particular. Um, uh, integrative health, uh, similarly in, in the non-dot-com sector, but in the dot-com sector, uh, we're talking billions 
So where is academic medicine in all this? Bringing the rigor that we like to use, um, but also taking advantage of this to provide income that might finance the care we're having trouble financing as we hopefully overhaul the health system, but that's a different um, talk. Even McKinsey, the number one global leader um, in, in uh, consulting, has an entire framework for healthy aging. This is where the boomers are. This is an area of opportunity, growth, creativity. Um, it's actually interesting that when you look at the wellness wheel and you look at age-friendly cities, um, there's a whole lot that's really similar about the components that people need for wellness. These fit very beautifully together. And I think this integrative aging endeavor um, is what brings them together in the care of individual patients. Um, I mentioned earlier um, Susan Friedman's work, um, and this is more of that. I think Julia might have been on this one. Um, a white paper uh, from the American Geriatric Society about how to do this. It still takes to my eye a fairly um, narrowed lifestyle medicine approach or very um, conventional approach. Um, it, it is uh, useful in thinking about older patients. Um, and I'll just recommend you think about where can we do primary prevention? Where can we do secondary prevention? And where can we do tertiary prevention? And as people become on the far end of old age in their nineties and hundreds, you might be doing more of the last two. And earlier on, you might be doing for some more of the first two. But the thing that's different about older people is that you might get a super healthy 95-year-old where you're really still working on primary prevention. And you might get a 68-year-old with all kinds of disease where you're really working on tertiary prevention. So unlike childhood and the earlier parts of adulthood, um, we don't march through old age um, stages uh, in a steady, predictable way. Um, it's also true that aging is uh, diverse within individuals. So a person might be able to run marathons, but not here. Another person might be in a wheelchair, um, but still leading a you know, 50,000 uh, person organization. There is a huge variety. Um, so sorry about that. We also need some scientific rigor in this space. Um, there are a lot of people, and in my OTR Center practice, I get asked about infusions of things where people are making claims and also asking for tens of thousands of dollars, which some patients can easily afford and many cannot. Um, there is some really interesting work going on in genomics, and there are some genomics tests I now send that are super helpful. Um, biomarkers can definitely guide care. Um, hormone replacement is, is an interesting uh, whole other topic. Um, I will note both that there is some evidence um, for benefit. There's a lot of evidence for not benefit, depending on which hormones, and every patient I have on them continues to age. Um, so, so lots of stuff out there, but, but where is the rigor that we apply in academic medicine? Uh, I also think uh, across um, the aging uh, sectors, there, there is a need for integration. There is a need for a more holistic view that, that integrative health brings. Um, general science talks about the things we can do really at the molecular level um, to combat aging. Gerontology uh, focuses on the diseases. And then in this view, which is offensive to many and a little shocking, um, geriatrics has, has been sort of associated with the very end. And what happens there is death. Uh, what happens at the end of life is death. Um, and I think geriatrics needs to hold, in to hold on to more of all of this, um, become specialists in geroscience, um, and use some of the integrative health techniques um, that would uh, help us with uh, gerontology and help people throughout the stages of old age. So how exactly might we do this? Um, part of it is really thinking about these stages. Um, uh, some people uh, may have seen uh, me use this slide before. If you Google the human lifespan, you almost invariably get an image like this. So we see the infant, um, the toddler, the child, um, the teenager, the young adult, then the adult, I guess, in the middle, um, maybe two of those. Um, then you get my stage, which is the second to last. So sort of uh, middle age, later middle age. Um, and, and then um, you get a wheelchair. So if you hit this sort of second to last stage in your 50s, um, and I have a lot of patients in their 90s and 100s, uh, isn't there something kind of missing here? 
it, it, there, there needs to be more of a balance and we need to think about the people from one place to the next. Um, I will also say that my gray hair notwithstanding, I have a mother 30 years my senior who is not in a wheelchair, although she is becoming frail. Uh, one of the ways I want us to think about each of the cases um, is uh, this framework, which was actually uh, devised for preventive testing uh, by my division chief, Louise Walter, um, where you think about an older patient in terms of what is their health status? What are their disease conditions? What's their functional ability? Where are they on the ability to disability spectrum? What's their life expectancy? And of course, we don't have a crystal wall, but there are things like e-prognosis um, that can help give us a sense. And we might have a gut sense, but we also know that our guts um, can err in either direction. Um, so, you know, if you're 105, even if you're really healthy, we're not expecting 20 years in most cases, for example. Um, what's their personal and sociocultural situation? I added that one in. I think it's critical to what a person, what a person's opportunities are, um, and also um, the mindset of uh, privilege or frustration that they bring to this endeavor of aging, um, and their goals and preferences. All right, so the first case at last. Um, this is Mr. A.O. He is 68, and these are all based on real patients. Um, he says, I'm pretty healthy and I want to stay that way as long as possible. I will do or take anything. Um, he, he specifically asked about calorie restriction. Um, he's a guy who does some running, does some mountain biking, um, a man of some privilege. Um, I find people who come in at, at this age in their 60s and ask about this are definitely uh, on the upper end of the privilege spectrum. Um, I actually saw a Latina patient, um, two patients after I saw this man. Um, she was 72, so just a few years older than he. Um, and her point was, you know, I'm really old now. So, you know, when you talk about exercise, that's not relevant to me. So what framework you come to, um, where where your sociocultural group continues considers old, what diseases you bring from your lifetime of experiences make a big difference. Um, calorie restriction. Uh, I kind of love this. So these um, primates are the same age. Uh, there is one uh, on the left uh, face and body and on the right face and body. They're the same age. The one on the right was calorie restricted its entire life. You see that its face is more full, less wrinkled. Um, its hair is much more full, its flanks are more full. So there's less of that wasting um, and, and those changes that we see with age. Um, I will note my most, most depressing uh, aging statistic is that we begin to lose our muscle mass in our thirties. Um, so, so what can we do about that? Uh, but, but this is also a pretty high bar. Um, you get all your essential nutrients, but 30 to 70% fewer calories. There are some humans who have done this. Um, whether it's as helpful um, as one might hope is less clear, the 30% seems clearly more feasible than the 70%. But it does um, target two of the four major aging pathways. Um, and I didn't want to go into too much science. I was also trying to make this um, talk friendly for everyone. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much of the gero science. Um, but there are things there that could be helpful to all of us and that will become part of practice, uh, like it or not. Um, it's, uh, it is proven to extend lifespan um, and delay morbidity, both as we see from these primates in non-humans. Um, and, and most of the human data is observational, um, but we'll come to this in a minute, but this whole intermittent fasting thing touches on this. Um, but the other area, and this is one that this man asked about, Mr. A.O., um, and that, that other people ask about, um, are these what we call CRMs or calorie restriction mimics, right? It's the American way. Uh, why restrict calories when I could eat what I want and take a pill? Um, you may have heard of, of some of these um, chemicals. Rapamycin is actually used in oncology. Its toxicity is such that, you know, to use it for health um, is not ready for prime time. Um, although there are studies, um, actually, if you go to grants.gov or, or go to um, clinical trials, uh, you will see lots of trials with each of these for particular diseases, you know, or conditions, heart failure, cancers, um, two more healthy aging uh, type uses. 
resveratrol had its fame with, uh, you know, red wine. Curcumin, we know, actually uh, helps a lot with arthritis. In the BCM95 formulation, there are decent studies for that. And on and on and on. I also know that at Harvard, um, there is one of the great proponents of taking some of these things. And I will say in talking to um, people who work on geroscience, um, aging science, a lot of them do take these. Um, but do we know for sure what whether they uh, help? Not so much in humans. There are some smaller studies. Um, some of the data, a lot of the data is at the level of we lowered your cholesterol, but we don't know if it'll prevent a heart attack yet types data. And I also want to point out the um, second to rightmost column here, which you can't really read, but I've, I've put references in throughout. Um, these are the foods from which you can get these effects. Now, can you always eat them in the quantities that will be most helpful? No, um, but you'll see as I go along that what we eat um, is a key way we can affect this if you can afford healthy foods and you have access to them. The goals here are fairly straightforward. For health span, um, if you consider the black line in the top diagram, um, normal aging, um, where at some point we drop below the line of disability and dependence. Um, it's a whole other thing about whether, you know, we have a certain amount of dependence, lifelong, et cetera. But we, we all know the sense, and actually I saw a man yesterday, um, 79 with Parkinson's, um, who didn't mind so much his bad disease, but minded very much his dependence. Um, so the intervention is ideally both shifts that curve to the right and rounds it out. So the period, um, the, the health span gets bigger, even though the lifespan stays the same and the period of disability and dependence is shortened. Um, similarly, enhancing resilience means when there's an acute stressor, um, a COVID-19 infection, uh, a stroke. Um, people don't go as, as far down in their functional abilities and they recover more quickly and robustly. Um, we actually have something that does this already um, and it's called exercise. Um, but, but as in the American way, people often want a pill instead. We know exercise works. Do we know these pills work? Not so much yet. Um, the NIA actually has a position on these um, calorie restriction mimics, um, which is basically more research is needed, which, you know, is the answer to so many questions. Um, but they really talk about uh, an integrative health approach with foods, exercise, alcohol, and you'll see that as a recurring theme. Um, what I like to do with patients, um, and this is where I began with Mr. A.O., um, was really talking about the healthy aging fundamentals. What do we know um, works and works not just for aging, but for preventing the morbidity that is common from so much, you know, from, from all different realms, you know, problems with insomnia, problems with depression, cancer cardiovascular risk, diabetes risk, et cetera. So I went through with him, um, as I do with most patients over time, you know, hard in one appointment to do everything, is physical activity. So physical activity, I mentioned earlier, the Latina, for her, um, she is a person who has never exercised. Um, she worked hard physically, and now she's, she's tired. And so exercise is the last thing she wants to do. But being physically active, um, so that she can do some of the things um, she really enjoys is something we could engage in. Um, with this man, he's an exerciser, so I use the word exercise. We talk about diet, sleep, social activity. Now, social activity becomes more and more important as people get older. And again, depending on your background, that may be in your 70s and it might be in your 80s, but what starts to happen is that your partner dies, your siblings die, a bunch of your friends die. Um, a new friend isn't going to replace a friend or a partner of 50, 60, 70 years, um, but any friends are better than no friends. So what are they doing at this age of 68 um, that is making friends across generations, um, that is joining organizations that'll still be there um, when some of his key supports are not? Um, working on reducing stress, uh, which does continue, and we'll actually come back to this in the next case, um, a sense of purpose uh, will also return to health-related behaviors. Um, so this is the, the drinking in moderation. And some of this sounds like basic preventive health because it is, and yet most of us as doctors are focusing on disease and not on these basic behaviors. 
Um, I also want to talk about another health related behavior, which is sexuality. The number one reason older people don't have sex is lack of a partner. And they appreciate people asking. There are um, different challenges um, with sexuality with age, all of which um, can be helped tremendously. And bringing it up also shows that it is a normal human expectation. Um, and that you are there um, to help make it uh, uh, fulfilling and meaningful for people as they age. Attitude about aging um, has a tremendous um, influence on how people age. Um, there is wonderful data from Becca Levy at Yale, um, which talks about people having Alzheimer's disease markers in their blood years uh, earlier, if they have negative attitudes, delaying the first cardiovascular event by 7.5 years, if they have positive attitudes. Um, this is something to explicitly ask about, probably because it determines whether people engage in these other behaviors, and probably also because if you have a self-loathing, if you are um, prejudiced against who you are at that stage in life, that is stressful and releases cortisone. And cortisone leads to low-level inflammation, which leads to disease and disability and aging. And by advanced planning, I mean things like um, not just do you want resuscitation. Uh, ideally, this man won't be in a situation where, where he needs that conversation for quite some time. Um, but his social activity, um, it's also possible that, that um, for people where they retire from work and they realize how much of their social life was at work. So do we plan for retirement? Do we plan for an encore career? Um, do we plan for where the person's going to live? Um, at UCSF some years ago, the number one reason older people were institutionalized after um, a hospitalization was not medical need, but a mismatch between their home environment and their uh, usually temporary, but not always uh, physical abilities post-hospitalization. Um, so some real basics. Um, and each of these could have its own lecture on how to manage this in older people. So uh, apologies for this high level look, um, but really thinking about how to do these things and how to help people. And each one has its own considerable literature. Um, for Mr. A.O., he does um, some sort of hiking and biking, but he doesn't do the four types of exercise recommended by the National Institutes on Aging. Um, so for his prescription, yeah, continue biking and hiking. Um, one of the things I do find older people don't do as much is the high intensity interval training. And if somebody's pretty fit, and even if they're not, they're walking slowly and they just speed up a little bit. It's that increase in your heart rate and in your breathing such that you can still walk that really helps with cardiovascular fitness. Um, older males in particular, and apologies for both being binary and the sweeping generalization, but don't tend to work as much on flexibility and balance. This is actually shown in large population-based studies. So um, if he could add something like that, this was something um, that he could do nicely with his um, wife uh, who uh, already was doing some of this. Um, and I mentioned earlier, I'm not gonna talk about Tai Chi to Tai Chi experts um, or mention yoga, um, but some of these things um, can be uh, helpful in, in uh, flexibility and balance. And there are ways of getting the last three simultaneously. For him also, because we start losing muscle mass, and, and he did bring this up, he's like, you know, I'm having more trouble with hills. Is, is that, you know, we know that uh, heart rate is immutable with age, but also uh, what you can do depends on your muscle bulk, and he's been losing bulk. Um, so uh, discussing strength training explicitly to build muscle. Uh, one of my favorite studies I like to quote actually took place um, at Harvard at the Hebrew Rehab Center um, with people in their 80s and 90s. Um, this was a 1995 study, I think, um, showing that people could build muscle and strength and increase their functional abilities, even if they were frail and already living in a nursing home. So imagine what this man might do. Um, Intermittent fasting, um, I also discussed with him as opposed to calorie restriction. There are, of course, many approaches to this. You know, five and two, you have two days where you just eat um, 500 calories. There's uh, having the amount of time where you don't eat 12 hours, 14 hours, 18 hours. Um, 
Interestingly, there are three really good articles on this, which I have referenced here. The review by Deb Cabo in New England Journal was particularly interesting in sort of showing how this works, but also showing that exercise moves its way in, periods of recovery, the sleeping and the eating work their way in. I mean, the, there are these recurrent themes and they are themes that at least um, doctors are not very taught very well, like the specifics of exercise counseling, um, the specifics of sleep, the specifics of um, dietary counseling. And one can refer to colleagues, but one of the things I've found is you have to make sure, A, the person's insurance covers it, um, and B, the colleague is versed in the sort of dietary changes that you um, are hoping for from your patient, um, and see that they don't bring an ageism to it. You know, thinking, oh, this person's, you know, 83 already, let's not worry about this. Um, when the short-term benefits are, are um, significant regardless of age. Um, you do have to think about intermittent fasting um, as people become very old and frail and are having trouble getting in enough calories. That may not be a person um, in whom to do this, um, but this is a 68-year-old uh, man, so young in the world of geriatrics. So what do I do? I discuss with him the types of this and which might or might not fit in his lifestyle. A gradual phase in because doing too much too soon is why most people fail. Um, ensuring he's still getting adequate nutrition given um, declining metabolism. Um, he is not a postmenopausal woman, so his metabolism has declined less um, than if he were female. Um, he wanted to discuss metformin. Uh, this is the uh, uh, prescription medication that most of the people um, in, in the aging um, sciences take. Um, it improves insulin sensitivity. So we again see that important pathway, which brings up a disease treatment or a preventive strategy. When people's A1C is up a little, uh, the, the current thing is like, oh, pre-diabetic, that's probably okay. And one could argue, you know, is it like DCIS where people probably, um, uh, you know, is that really cancer? Are we scaring people and doing surgeries unnecessarily? Um, you know, is this a marker of aging? I am old enough to remember that um, when I was in training at Harvard Medical School, they said, well, blood pressure naturally goes up with age. So you don't need to treat it as, as um, you, you don't need to be as strict in controlling blood pressure as people get old. And then it turned out that yes, it goes up with age and lowering it saves people from having strokes. So do we know this is where this is? We don't, but there is a whole lot of suggestive evidence um, that managing, um, improving insulin sensitivity um, helps uh, with uh, DNA repair, helps with mitochondria. Um, it works as an antioxidant. Um, it does so much um, that uh, is likely to be helpful, helpful um, at least at the physiological level. Um, it may slow aging and increase the lifespan, although the data on that is somewhat mixed. Um, we know there are side effects. Um, they're relatively uh, minor, um, as we like to say in medicine, though the person with diarrhea and GI discomfort and fat flatulence may feel differently. The dose commonly used here is 500 BID. Um, what I said to this guy, because I'm a little conservative, I'll admit, was let's check your A1C and a few other tests because what is his cardiovascular risk and what is his A1C? Do we need to go to a drug with side effects um, at this point? Maybe he's doing well enough um, that he can do all this on his own without a medication. Are there other people in whom I have done this? Um, rarely, but yes. All right, so that's our first guy and apologies for moving quickly. Um, we now come to case two. Some of you may have seen this um, in the New York Times a few weeks or a month ago. Um, uh, asking, uh, well, can I skip the statins and just take supplements? And I had actually just seen someone about this. Um, and uh, I'm calling her Mrs. NT. So she's 78, widowed for four years. Um, she's unretired, which I kind of love. So she spent the better part of a decade taking care of her husband who had Parkinson's. Um, and then he died and she was, um, she had always been volunteering a little, but she upped her hours a lot. And then the guy she was working with most closely retired. He's actually, he was actually younger than she. And she applied for his job and got it. I just love this. She's fantastic. Anyway, so she has hypertension and hyperlipidemia for her natural approaches. So this was why her internist sent her to me. Um, she's also trying to lose weight. She is overweight, not obese. Um, she does walk three to five miles most days, which again shows how um, the uh, postmenopausal woman um, is metabolically disadvantaged. Um, 
Her blood pressure was normal, interestingly, until she went back to work. Um, she was prescribed Travastatin, which she stopped. And her question to me is, you know, aren't there supplements I can take instead of medications? Um, and I've listed that she's already on some supplements, um, you know, and she has uh, some other, uh, you know, medical conditions, bilateral hearing loss. She's got hearing aids. Um, she has some osteopenia. She has a history of vitamin D deficiency. Um, but she's pretty much a healthy person. And you look at her and she's, you know, amazing. So what do you do about supplements? Um, I do a few things. One of them is I like to tell patients that to me, they are medications, a substance used for medical treatment at a dosage that contains one or more active ingredients. Um, that's the NCI definition. Uh, and you'll see this graph on the right here, which um, uh, this is a particular one, um, sort of number of medications and risk of hospitalization um, from a study of a couple of years ago. Um, but we have seen this over and over. There are similar graphs that show risk of falls. Now, do certain medications, are certain medications more likely to have you fall or land in the hospital at age 78? Absolutely. Um, but do supplements count in these metrics? Um, in many of them, they do. Uh, so we really have to think about with patients who are 78, even if they're in fantastic shape like this woman, you know, how many things is she already taking? Which ones are to her advantage? This is really bringing the, the geriatric lens to this. Um, there are risks of medication, medication interactions, medication disease interactions, and medication person interactions um, that increase regardless of what you're giving that person. There are also the financial risks. Um, and when you are a healthy 78-year-old, um, you are likely to live uh, possibly 20 more years. Um, you're also less likely, um, if you live at this moment in history, to have worked um, enough years to have a significant pension. And it's quite likely, because of the way pension systems were in the past, that you will get a tiny fraction of your husband's pension. Um, so she needs also enough money to live comfortably and safely another 20 years. You know, are supplements the best way of spending that money? Sometimes yes, and sometimes no. Um, for uh, the, the non-integrative health practitioners in the audience, um, you know, how do you know what to prescribe or what to tell people to get? Um, these three labels you see in the upper right, um, and, and you can search them, um, are labels that indicate um, a, a following of the particular company and a voluntary submission of that manufacturer to make sure that what's in the pill is what's supposed to be in the pill in the right amount and that it doesn't contain something else that you're not expecting. Um, you've probably read the news articles about melatonin that is in fact diphenhydramine or, or Benadryl that contains no melatonin whatsoever, but contains this drug that we know can be quite dangerous in older people. Um, you know, uh, there are also things to know, like maybe you don't want to buy from Amazon uh, through a secondary uh, supplier, because that often means that the supplements are sitting in very hot or very cold garages, denaturing, waiting for orders to come in. Um, there are things like that that can be really helpful in counseling patients about supplements. Um, what I like to talk to them about is absolutely vitamins and minerals pay, play key roles in biological function. Um, but that often, you know, plausible hypotheses don't pay out. Um, so what are we going to tell this woman? Um, you know, the NIA offers some information about what's helpful, but it is not really helpful in answering our question. Um, it, it's fairly conservative. Uh, most of the federal guidelines about supplements have to do more with uh, avoiding deficiency than in determining optimal levels. Um, when thinking about uh, medicines that can help with hypertension or supplements, we often think about vitamin D, magnesium, and omega-3 um, fatty acids. Each one has a plausible mechanism. Um, what I like to do in integrative health is think about what other conditions my patients have. So in this case, this was a woman with vitamin D deficiency. So vitamin D is a good option for her. Um, she also has osteopenia. So I kind of get a win-win-win and I'm hearing her about um, hypertension. The benefit, uh, if real, and I would say it is a little bit uncertain, small studies um, will be small. 
Magnesium might also help her because she has headaches and she sometimes uh, increasingly with her new job is having trouble sleeping. So maybe a little magnesium glycinate at bedtime. So I'm hearing her, I'm treating multiple conditions. Um, you know, maybe some omega-3 fatty acids, but in her case, actually her diet was such that I didn't feel like um, we needed to go there. But meeting the patient where they're at and thinking, are there supplements that can help with multiple problems, um, multiple conditions for this person so that I'm both working with them, acknowledging their preference, um, and, and also saying, we can try this for a period of time as we try weight loss and exercise, um, and then move on to consider um, uh, other approaches. So here, really talking to her about the basics, um, including a DASH diet. Um, diet figures here a lot. Um, so discussing with her what she eat, what she's eating, but also what she's not eating um, in terms of those omega-3 fatty acids and really talking about diet as a natural approach. It doesn't have to be a pill um, and all the other fundamentals. Um, I sometimes actually pull up uh, something like this, which shows that even in older people, you can get changes in her case, both in her blood pressure and in her cholesterol in just six to eight weeks um, with a changed diet, with moving to DASH, um, and, and that this can happen at all ages. Um, and then I mentioned conventional medications. Uh, I, I, uh, the best way of coming at this, and this is again a sort of integrative motivational interviewing approach, you know, not necessarily not um, from conventional medicine, although use less there. But what diseases or conditions does she fear most as she gets older? Her husband is dead. Um, she does not have children. Um, so if she were to have a stroke, who would take care of her? Where would she end up? Um, how much does not having a stroke mean to her? Um, you can also look at, um, uh, there are papers by Saley and colleagues about the number needed to treat, and that will depend on where her systolic blood pressure is and what her life expectancy is. Um, so really pulling from conventional literature here and other literatures. And what we decided was we'd give her a few months working on this um, and then touch base again, but that I thought um, that these measures were absolutely going to help and may be not sufficient um, to, to to do adequate stroke prevention for her. Um, I had a feeling I was a little long here, so I'm gonna quickly go through my last case um, and leave us 10 minutes, not 15 for discussion with apologies. Um, so dementia is one of the biggest fears along with cancer of people as they age. Um, so Mrs. LMN, um, 82 year old, increasingly forgetful, doing things more slowly, no trouble with any of her household tasks, worried because her mother had um, Alzheimer's, her friends are ill and dying, her husband's actually healthy, but he's running around doing things. She had breast cancer last year, which brought her face to face with her mortality, although she did well. She has a variety of other conditions. She is clearly depressed and having trouble sleeping. Um, and she saw ads on TV um, for a pill that might help with her. Um, but she's sure she has Alzheimer's um, not that you know, normal changes of aging can lead to some slowing and depression and insomnia make it much worse, especially if you're 82. Um, and then she heard about a program in Marin that cures people of dementia. Um, so really important um, to make sure which specific pill people are talking about and whether um, as with the one she heard about Prevagen, there are huge lawsuits um, and or the FDA um, has uh, filed stipulations against 17 companies really preying on people's desperation um, not to get Alzheimer's. I also need to mention at this moment in uh, sort of a pharmacology, uh, you know, uh, history, there are some new drugs for Alzheimer's, which I am not discussing in this presentation, um, that have their own controversies and hopefully potential, um, at least with the more recent one, um, not going there. Uh, some great discussions on uh, the Jerry Powell podcast, if you're interested um, in, in some of these latest meds. But the book she was talking about was The End of Alzheimer's by Dale Bredesen, who actually started at the Buck Institute um, near UCSF, which is a great um, uh, geroscience um, sort of a think tank center uh, up on a hill. Um, and, and he has an ad, and you'll notice that this is a dot-com site. You'll also notice that it um, talks about uh, published work in this area. Um, I wanna call your attention to this article by Daly et al in the Theoretical uh, Medical Bioethics, which really takes down the science used. Um, for instance, zero of the three articles met widely accepted ethical criteria. 
Um, one of them was in a predatory open access journal. Um, none of it, uh, none of this science um, achieved IRB, you know, approval. Um, so, so there are some real ethical questions here. Is there some stuff in that book, you know, which talks about diet and lifestyle and is helpful? Yes. Does this necessarily disprove some of the approaches? No. Um, but it would be $30,000 per patient. And if we applied it to everybody having cognitive change, it would be 40% of the monthly Medicare budget. So there are lots of reasons to rethink this, even as some of the approaches might be helpful. Um, so I refer people instead to the Lancet Commission report in 2020, which really just echoes the fundamentals of healthy aging care. Um, with normalizing weight, not smoking, drinking alcohol only occasionally, on and on and on. And I just want to highlight one um, in geriatrics, which is hearing loss. There is, we don't know that giving people hearing aids will uh, slow the decline um, in people who are declining cognitively, but we do know that people with moderate hearing loss are three to five times more likely to develop dementia. There are a variety of mechanisms for this. But in my whole career, this association has led people to say like, no, I go from, no, I don't need a hearing aid to I will get one next week. Where do I go? Um, there are also lots of articles lately on the best over-the-counter hearing aids for people who can't afford, um, you know, the $8,000 um, it syncs with your uh, iPhone variety. Um, and they tend to talk about the same companies over and over. So um, not the scientific literature, but helpful um, the MIND diet is a combination of Mediterranean and DASH, so also something to go over with her, although clearly more important than this is treating her depression. Um, so how do we help her take back control of her life? Maybe with some 478 breathing, a technique you can easily Google um, and give to people, and that even people with early cognitive loss can do. Uh, this is, again, data from uh, Harvard um, and other places that really increases, decreases sympathetic tone and increases parasympathetic. Um, talking about purpose, which really makes a difference and was part of this woman's problem. She had lost her sense of purpose and what she could or couldn't do. The people she was helping um, no longer needed her help. And she didn't have it in her mind that she might start something new at her age. Um, she since has, and it's made a huge difference. So again, what questions you ask older people can make a real difference, um, a typical day, what impact has aging had? Do you feel lonely? Um, what matters most in your life? If you could be doing anything right now, what would you do? What are your plans for next year? And I'll just close by saying the Age Self-Care Program, which Julie and I are working on bringing to Harvard, um, is one way we help people in groups motivate each other um, to to engage with their own health and aging across the stages of old age. And we have had people from age 67 to age 96 participate with great success. And apologies for going over. Um, I see Julia has reappeared, so I'll now behave myself. <laughs> Thank you, that was wonderful. Um, I We have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, and I guess maybe I'll just start off saying, you're an educator as well. And so I'm wondering, you, you, you know, you've compiled such uh, this really wonderful area of expertise in integrative aging. So is there, how would you envision bringing, bringing this more to trainees? I think specifically geriatric fellows who I, who I think could benefit from a lot of this knowledge. Yeah, well, I give, I uh, have a one hour talk in our core curriculum each year. So, so that's about it. Um, they can do an elective rotation with me in my clinic. Um, I actually think, uh, and you and I might do this together, we've discussed this as part of, um, uh, thanks to our OSHA collaborative grant, um, thinking about uh, how do we both write so that we give uh, advice for people how to do this in practice, but also thinking about how do we include this in geriatrics training. Um, I think what I talked about at the beginning with geriatrics keeps doing the same thing and then keeps lamenting how small it is. Um, and yet there's this multi-billion dollar industry of people really interested in healthy aging. And I think if we trained our trainees to take care of well elders as well as frail elders, um, that we would have um, more patients, more enthusiasm, more trainees, 
Um, and, and I think, you know, on the one hand, we have got to get people able to talk about frailty um, and death and the parts that are scary. And um, that doesn't preclude also talking about how can we help you live your best life through the decades and substages of old age. Um, so many arguments for doing that, but I think we have to outline how to include that more. Um, I'm actually working with Andrea Schwartz on something that we hope might get into the core curriculum at HMS um, that would include some of some of this um, training over a series of um, meetings with a senior mentor. Um, so, so hopefully slowly and effectively over time, um, we include it. It's also a good chance for um, double credit, um, addressing certain health conditions, working on integrative medicine, on diversity, equity, inclusion, on aging simultaneously. That's wonderful. Uh, we have a great question here about uh, how people adapt to loss as they get older. And I, I think even uh, Donald Hall uh, the poet said that aging was a ceremony of loss in one of his books. Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more how you talk to patients about that and how you think about that as it relates to attitudes about aging. Yeah, Donald Hall's books, um, the, uh, something 80 and then notes nearing, nearing 90, um, are not cheerful, but do bring a sense of humor and realism um, uh, to the aging process. Um, so, you know, how do we deal with losses? I mean, I think first you really acknowledge them. I spoke a little bit about social connections. Um, in age self-care, we help people make new connections and that's not only within the group, um, but between the weekly sessions um, that they have kind of not homework because apparently nobody likes that work unless you're a nerd like some of us. So <laughs> I learned the hard way. Not everybody thinks like, oh, it's a good thing to have homework. Um, and get to do something new, um, but they have activities that they do between sessions, which include, you know, finding groups. Um, you know, I really think it's important to acknowledge the losses um, and to have some uh, skills in grief and grief counseling, even if you are not the prime grief counselor, um, knowing who you can refer people to. And I know we have an organization in San Francisco that does grief groups for older adults. Um, so knowing about those groups, but also just sitting and listening um, and acknowledging the loss. Um, I think I learned the hard way over decades of practice that there are sessions where I think like, oh, I didn't do anything for that patient. And often those are the ones where they say like, this was the best doctor's appointment I've ever had. Um, so it's kind of the opposite of our training as doctors. Um, and, and just acknowledging that loss. And when I talk about social activities, I always say, this is not the same, you know, as calling your sister, you know, that you knew your whole life, who is now dead. Um, and, you know, you can grieve that while also having other connections that help you to feel well and get moments of pleasure and happiness. And I also think that's an argument for healthy aging and starting sooner, because if we can get people to make these social relationships across generations earlier, they will have people they've known for years or decades when the people who are their age, you know, the people their age um, are all gone. Um, it's hard to choose. We have so many good questions. I'll, right, I'll just- I have time. This is a I have... talk in my big mouth problem. I'll choose one more. So if if you could, I guess, I, in an ideal healthcare system, wh at what age or stage would you have people become connected with a geriatrician? Ah, well, I think that presumes a couple of things. I mean, in my ideal world, uh, geriatrics- uh, was evolved, you know, in the American Geriatric Society followed the American Academy of Pediatrics just 10 years later um, in the first half of the last century. Um, and we now, you know, unless you're really in a place where there isn't a pediatrician, you would take your child to a pediatrician, of course. Um, I would love to live in a world where the same was true at the other end of the age spectrum. Um, but, but as I said earlier, we don't you know, you go through predictable stages, barring grave illness um, as a child. The same is not true through adulthood. So some people may need um, the geriatric lens on function and quality of life um, earlier at 60, for example. Um, and some people may not need it till 75, um, depending. Um, I also think this there's this amorphous middle area of, of, you know, like we call people older adults now. Um, 
and, and it's funny, geriatrics says that starts at 65, but I feel so clearly like an older adult, I can't tell you, and I'm not 65 yet. Um, so I think there will be overlap between internal medicine and geriatrics, just as there is overlap between pediatrics or adolescent medicine specialists um, and internists. Uh, so I would see it over the decades of old age. So sometime in the 60s or 70s forward over a span of 40 or 50 years. I also think that's important as the medical literature grows you know, by what is it, like 9,000 articles a day? How are you going to master from age 18 to age 108? I just, I'm not sure that's feasible. Yeah, well, this was, this is really wonderful. I think we're all feeling inspired. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Gloria for a couple of closing announcements. Thank you again. Yes, thank you so much, um, Dr. Aronson, for that fantastic talk and really, um, you know, relevant and, and resonating with all of us uh, for healthy aging. Um, so another uh, reminder for those who missed it at the very beginning, please go to Osher Science of TCQ for information on the call for abstracts and symposia proposal that are due April 21st for our September conference on mind-body movement and whole person health. And then also last but not least, please join us next month on May 2nd for our next grand round speaker, uh, Dr. Laura Baker from Wake Forest University. And she'll be speaking on lifestyle and cognitive health, uh, dovetailing a little bit on what we spoke about today. Um, so I hope to see you all there. So thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.